The very first sequence that we've ever encountered is the most straightforward one. Start from the number one and add one to get the next number two, the next number three, the next number four, and so on and so forth. This is a sequence of numbers in that you have essentially a list of numbers that keeps on going. For example, if we were to take each of these numbers and raise them to the power of 2 instead, so that we will get 1, followed by 2 squared, followed by 3 squared, followed by 4 squared, followed by 5 squared, and so on and so forth, we will obtain yet another sequence known as the sequence of square numbers. If instead of adding 1 each time, we multiply by 2 to get the next number, we will also get yet another sequence which are the powers of 2. And we could instead take the same sequence, but instead of multiplying by 2, we divide by 2 each time around to get the next term. These are different sequences whose general nth term is given by n, n squared, 2 to the n minus 1, and 1 over 2 to the n minus 1 respectively. A natural question to ask is that of convergence. If we were to take n and jack it up all the way to infinity, what would happen to these sequences? The general term of the first sequence is simply n, which goes to infinity. The second term is n squared, which essentially can be thought of as infinity times infinity, which goes to infinity at a much faster rate. Likewise, for the powers of 2, since n minus 1 approaches infinity, 2 to the infinity approaches infinity at an even faster rate. But something interesting happens with the fourth sequence. Since n approaches infinity, 2 to the infinity approaches infinity. But if you take the reciprocal, you get 1 divided by a very large number. This approaches 0. In this case, we say that the sequence dn converges to 0, while all of the other sequences diverge. But a natural question to ask would be, adding up these terms. We will use the Greek letter sigma to denote summation, and all this is is a shorthand notation for term-by-term -term addition. For example, we are adding up 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, all the way up to the nth term. For the second sum, we're going to sum up all of the square numbers, which means we're taking 1 plus 4 plus 9 plus 16 all the way up to n squared. Likewise, for the third sum, we add up 1, 2, 4, so on and so forth, all the way up to 2 to the n minus 1. And finally, for the last sum, we're going to add up the reciprocals of the powers of 2, which means we take 1 plus a half plus a quarter all the way up to 1 over 2 to the n minus 1. But how do we actually go about calculating these sums in the first place? Let's first consider the sum of a bunch of 1s. We are essentially adding up 1 a total of n times. But what happens if we were to add up the integers? That is 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to n. We're going to calculate what seems to be an unrelated expression, but it will be useful in the derivation later on. When we calculate this expression, we sub in k equals 1 to get 1 squared minus 0 squared, followed by k equals to 2 to get 2 squared minus 1 squared, followed by k equals to 3 to get 3 squared minus 2 squared, so on and so forth. We'll add up all the way to an n squared minus n minus 1 squared. The key observation is that the 1 squares would cancel each other out, the 2 squares would cancel each other out, the 3 squares would cancel each other out, so on and so forth, all the way until the pair of n minus 1 squared terms cancel each other out. What remains is the expression n squared minus 0 squared, which simplifies to n squared. However, looking at the exact same expression, we could simplify this expression using a little bit of algebra, and we can use some natural summation properties to bring out the 2 and the negative sign. The summation of 1 is simply n as we have calculated previously, and now we observe that the same expression can be calculated in two different ways. So we can equate these two expressions together. 
we can do a bit of algebra and obtain that the sum of the integers is equal to n over 2 times 1 plus n. We could play the same game involving the powers of 2 and more generally the powers of r. We can first consider the expression r to the k subtracted by r to the k minus 1 and expand it by substituting k. Substituting k equals to 1 gives us r to the 1 subtracted by r to the 0, followed by r to the 2 minus r to the 1, followed by r to the 3 minus r to the 2, so on and so forth until we get r to the n subtracted by r to the n minus 1. Just like before, the r to the 1s cancel each other out, the r to the 2s cancel each other out, the r to the 3s cancel each other out, all the way until the pair of r to the n minus 1s cancel each other out. This is known as the method of differences because the differences essentially cancel each other out. We are left with r to the n subtracted by r to the 0, which simplifies to r to the n minus 1. Just like before, we can calculate this sum in a slightly different manner. We can factorize r to the k minus 1 and pull out r minus 1 because it's a constant with respect to k. Just like before, the same expression can be calculated in two different ways. So we can equate these ways together and do a bit of algebra to have the sum of the powers of r equal to 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. Consider this new sum which we did not introduce in our analysis just now. Using partial fraction techniques, we can decompose the fraction into 1 over k minus 1 over k plus 1. We can now substitute k equals to 1 to get 1 over 1 minus 1 over 2, plus 1 over 2 minus 1 over 3, so on and so forth until we get 1 over n subtracted by 1 over n plus 1. All the middle terms cancel each other out, and we're left with 1 subtracted by 1 over n plus 1. And we can ask the question on convergence yet again. What happens when we take n to infinity? The first sum equaling n will approach infinity. The second sum is essentially an expression of the form infinity over 2 times 1 plus infinity, which approaches infinity all the same. The third expression is a rather interesting one. If our n approaches 0, we get convergence, but this only works when the modulus of r is less than 1. And finally, the final sum, since n going to infinity causes 1 over n plus 1 to approach 0, must converge to 1. A really useful type of sequence is known as an arithmetic progression. These are sequences where you start with a number a and you add a constant difference d each time. In other words, the first term is a and the difference between any two terms must be d. This means the difference between u sub k plus 1 and u sub k must equal d, and we can take the summation on both sides. As an exercise in the method of difference, you can show that un minus u1 must equal n minus 1 times d. Doing a bit of algebra, we obtain the general formula for the nth term of an arithmetic progression. Using this nth term, we can sum on both sides, do a little bit of algebra, pull out some irrelevant constants, and apply the results that we've derived previously. Cleaning up with a little bit of algebra, we can obtain the formula for the sum of the first n terms of an arithmetic progression. What if instead of adding by a common difference d, we multiply it by a common ratio r? This is known as a geometric progression, and just like before, we can start with this crucial property of a geometric progression, and we're going to multiply a bunch of ratios on the left. This equals multiplying r n minus 1 times. But the left side can simplify to v sub n over v sub 1, while the right side simplifies to r to the n minus 1. Doing a bit of algebra, we obtain the formula for the nth term of a geometric progression. Using this nth term once again, we can find a formula that captures the sum of the first n terms of a geometric progression. We can sum up these terms on both sides, and on the right side we can pull out the constant a. What remains is the sum of the powers of r. 
but we have a formula for the sum of the powers of r. It is given by 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. Doing some algebra, we obtain the geometric series formula. But what happens when n goes to infinity? If r to the n approaches 0, this sum will converge to a over 1 minus r. This would happen when the modulus of r is less than 1. This is known as the sum to infinity of a convergent geometric series, and it's given by the first term divided by 1 minus the common ratio. Geometric series are really useful involving problems pertaining compound interest. Suppose you take $15,000 and place them in a bank. You top up your account by $5,000, and this bank offers an interest rate of 3% per year. We will let m denote the multiplier, which essentially tells us how much our money would multiply at the end of the year. Drawing a table, two processes would happen. Firstly, our amount would get added by c, followed by being multiplied by m. In the first year, we deposit $15,000, and at the end of the year, the amount gets multiplied by m. In the second year, we top it up by $5,000, and this new entire amount gets multiplied by m. In the third year, this amount, pm squared plus cm, gets topped up by another c, and this whole expression gets multiplied by m. You can repeat this for the fourth year, and continuing the pattern, we can obtain formulae for the nth year as well. But this formula seems rather long and complicated. Let's write it down at the bottom for some extra space. And we can factor the c from the expression involving the m's. What remains is the sum 1 plus m plus m squared all the way to m to the n minus 2. But this sum is the sum of a geometric progression with common ratio m. This tells us that we can plug in the formula for the sum of a geometric series, and multiplying this expression by m, we obtain the amount that we have in our bank at the end of the nth year. We could even plug in the actual numbers and obtain the amount that we would have after n years, and ask the question, how much money do we have after 10 years? All we need to do is substitute n equals to 10, and use our calculator to obtain $70,367. These ideas give a brief introduction to sequences in a nutshell.